The internal combustion engine that we use in most cars is powered by something called the auto cycle, which, yes, is a coincidence. <laughs> so it has four steps. The first is a compression step. This is when you take, you start with a, a mixture of air and gasoline. This is what you're compressing and expanding. And you compress it quickly, adiabatically. So here's the compression step. The next thing you do is you ignite it. You ignite, ignite the gasoline. This, of course, raises, raises the, uh, so you ignite it at constant volume. This causes the temperature and the pressure to rise by quite a bit. Once it ignites, you let the pressure build up, and then you have what's called the power stroke. We allow the gas to expand adiabatically, that is, quickly. And the fourth step is called the exhaust step. And this is actually kind of cheating, because we're not actually taking the gas and cooling it, but instead we're tossing out the old air gasoline mix which we can't use anymore because the gasoline is already used up and we replace it with cooler fresh air gasoline mixture. If we call this volume the maximum volume and this one the minimum volume then the ratio of those two V max to V min is called the compression ratio. And the efficiency of this engine we can show is equal to 1 minus the inverse of the compression ratio, V min over V max, raised to the gamma minus first power, where gamma is the adiabatic exponent we saw before. So it depends on what type of gas we're using. Um, to make this efficient, To increase the efficiency, we want to make this compression ratio as big as possible. We want to compress it a lot. But there's a problem with that, and the problem is if we compress it too much, the gas gets too hot, and the gasoline pre ignites. Okay. We need it to ignite during the ignition step, step, and we need to burn, and if it pre-ignites, that means it's going to ignite during the compression step, and um, it's going to give us a different cycle and not work very well. Now, if you picture, um, you've probably seen pictures of gasoline engines we have a series of pistons connected together, etc. So this, so if this one is if this one is moving up, these are moving down. Then this piston is in the power stage and this one is in the, these two are in the compression stage and they're connected to each other so the compression the power stage of one is helping to drive the compression steps of other ones and then down here are spark plugs which are what cause the gasoline to ignite there has to be good timing there has to be a timing between the spark plug and the pistons and if that timing is off then we don't get the perfect the the auto cycle as written and the efficiency is knocked off as well. Now a diesel engine works a little differently. 
the cycle looks a little different, but that's not really the, the important part. The cycle part is you've got a compression, which is again an adiabat, and the ignition stage we allow the pressure, to, we keep the pressure constant, and we allow its volume to stay the same. And then you've got the power stroke. Oh, okay. And then the exhaust is at constant volume. Oops. Yes, that's right. Okay, that's the diesel cycle. But the key thing about the diesel cycle is the fuel is only added at the star. Here, let me draw the star in red. So unlike, unlike the gasoline engine, where the, in the auto cycle, where the gasoline is there the whole time, fuel is only added at the star. So there's no chance of pre-ignition. This allows us to, this allows the engine to can have much larger compression ratios. And we mentioned this earlier. We can get the diesel fuel can ignite because the, if the compression ratios are greater, we can increase the temperature without a spark plug, without a spark. The fuel can ignite due to the temperature of the air. No spark plugs. A diesel engine doesn't need spark plugs. That means timing isn't as much of an of an issue. The compression ratio is greater, which means the efficiency is greater, which is why diesel engines are more efficient than regular automobile engines of the same basic design. Now, I'm not going to get too much into it. I don't know a lot about cars. Uh, so if you do, hopefully I didn't say anything too wrong. All right, that's engines. If you reverse a heat engine, you get what's called a refrigerator. Let's, first of all, let's talk about what a refrigerator does. A refrigerator transfers heat from cold to hot. Seems like a weird way to describe it, but think about it. Your refrigerator, you've got Everything in the refrigerator is already, let's say, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So, I don't know, 8 degrees Celsius, 8 degrees, no, like 4 degrees Celsius, whatever it is. And normally, heat, the thing inside the refrigerator, heat is going to want to flow into the refrigerator. But instead, the refrigerator wants to keep, wants to counteract that natural heat flow. And so the refrigerator needs to transfer heat from the cold interior of the refrigerator to the hotter exterior. So it needs to reverse the natural flow of heat. Ideally, this is what would happen, right? You'd have heat from the cold flow in, flows into this refrigerator and then it flows out to the hot. This violates the second law of thermodynamics, however, because heat doesn't do that. In terms of energy, uh, sorry, in terms of entropy, the fridge gains an entropy, uh, gains an, the heat, the fridge gains entropy equal to the amount of heat that's flowing in divided by the temperature of the refrigerator when it flows in. And this has to be greater than or equal to Q over TC. Why? Because if heat is going to flow into the refrigerator, 
That means that the end, when the heat flows into the refrigerator, the temperature of the refrigerator has to be less than the cold reservoir. So the fridge gains entropy equal to, which is greater than Q in over T C. The fridge loses entropy equal to the amount of heat that flows out divided by the temperature of the refrigerator when it flows out. And this has to be less than or equal to the heat flow divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir because the engine has to be hotter than the hot reservoir in order to, for heat to flow in that direction. So we're imagining a refrigerator which gets colder than the inside and then to absorb heat into it and then it gets hotter than the outside so it can dump heat into the outside. So the total chain in entropy is equal to S in minus S out. And that's going to be greater than or equal to Q in over TC minus Q out over TH. The total change in entropy has to be zero because we're thinking of this as a cyclic process unless you want the refrigerator to only run once. If Q in is equal to Q out, as it's pictured above, if we assume that the heat in is equal to the heat out, then Delta S is greater than zero, actually. Let me, let me be a little more specific. So the change in entropy in that case is greater than or equal to Q in times 1 over TC minus 1 over TH. But this is positive because TC is small, so that means that 1 over TC is big, and TH is big, so 1 over TH is small. So this is a positive quantity. And this is positive. And that means that the change in entropy is greater than zero, which means this is not a cycle. What do we need then? Well, if we want this delta S to be zero, we need more heat to flow out than flows in. Right? We need more heat to flow out than flows in. Well, where's that extra energy going to come from? Well, if I want more heat to flow out, that means I need to provide energy. I can't provide it as heat because I already took care of that. That means that I must provide it as work. I need Q out to be greater than Q in, which means I must put work into the fridge. So here's what an actual refrigerator looks like. Cold reservoir, heat flows in to the refrigerator, work flows in, and then heat flows out. Notice that Q in plus W is equal to Q out. Now, for engines, we talked about efficiency. For refrigerators, we talked about the coefficient of performance. The coefficient of performance is the ratio of the heat that is absorbed by the refrigerator divided by the work that you have to do. So the more work you have to do, the smaller the performance, coefficient of performance, and the more heat that you suck out of the cold reservoir, which in this case is our food in the refrigerator, the greater the coefficient of performance. Again, I can write this, uh, the work, as Q out minus Q in 
So I can write this entirely in terms of heat. I can also write this as 1 over Q out over Q in minus 1. Notice that there's there's no reason that the coefficient of performance has to be less than 100, less than 1. And in fact, coefficients of 5 or 10 are, are perfectly normal to run into. So for example, if the coefficient of performance is equal to 5, that means I need 20 joules of work to remove 100 joules of heat from the cold reservoir. Okay. So according to this formula, zero has to be greater than or equal to Qn over Tc minus Q out over Th. If I play with that a little bit, so zero has to be greater than or equal to Qn over Tc minus Q out over Th. If I move Q out over Th over to the left, and I move things around a little bit, I get that the ratio of Qn to Qout has to be less than or equal to the ratio of Tc to Th. And so that means that COP, the coefficient of performance, which is 1 over Qout over Qin minus 1, that has to be less than or equal to 1 over the temperature of the hot reservoir divided by the temperature of the cold reservoir minus 1. Or we could write this as Tc over Th minus Tc. So that's the upper limit. So what, how can I make the coefficient of performance larger? I can, it's larger if Th minus Tc is small. That is, if the Difference in temperature is not a great deal. It, your refrigerator will have much greater performance if you're not trying to cool things down too much from the ambient temperature. So freezers are going to have a lower coefficient of performance generally than refrigerators will. And they will have even lower coefficient of performance if, they are, uh, if you're using them in a hot environment. So for example, if Tc is equal to 273 Kelvin, that is I want to keep something at freezing temperature, and Th is equal to room temperature, 300 Kelvin, or a little warmer than that, and you do the math, you get that CO, this coefficient of performance is equal to 10. So that, uh, uh, no, rather I should say that the coefficient of performance is less than or equal to 10. The ideal refrigerator, the one which meets this li limit, is called a Carnot refrigerator. And that's simply a Carnot engine in reverse. It's not always possible to reverse an engine to get a refrigerator, but in the case of the Carnot cycle, you can. So in the Carnot refrigerator, you can, well, it looks something like this. So the first step is you 
lower the temperature to just below Tc quickly, adiabatically. And step two is you let heat flow in from the cold reservoir. Notice you have to lower the temperature to just below the cold reservoir, so be, or otherwise heat won't actually flow uh, into your engine. And then the third step is you raise the temperature to just above TH quickly. And then the fourth step is you let heat flow out to the hot reservoir. And this is, again, as in the Carnot engine, steps two and steps four are isothermal. So very slow.